I want you to imagine just for a second, it's always good to start with I want you to imagine, right? I want you to imagine that right behind me is the slide that I forgot to give Tansel for today. And that slide is a picture of a pair of little green legs when you're standing at the uh, intersection and you're about to cross and the little person turns green. I want to ask you, what's the very first thing you do when you see that symbol up there? What's the very first thing that you do? <sighs> wrong. No, there's no wrong and right answers here. <laughs> Just that one. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, that's not the first thing you do. What's the first thing you do when you see that little green person start to walk up there? Nope, you're also wrong. Please don't talk ever again. So, uh, anyone else? What's the very first thing that you do? So this is all about intuition and counterintuition today, right? So the very first thing that you would imagine that you do is that you walk, or the yeah, you would, you know, it's the it's a mistake that you made, but it's a totally okay mistake. The second big mistake that you make uh, is that you look left and you look right. But actually, the very first thing that everybody does when the little person turns green is this. So the first thing that everybody does is everybody looks down at the ground, right? Now you may think, oh yes, we all knew that, but nobody said it, right? The very first thing that you do is you look down at the ground. This may not seem like a huge thing, but I've been teaching actors for over 20 years, and I've asked that question to most of the actors that I've taught out of the 5,000 people that I've taught. Not one single actor, maybe once I think in the entire 20 years, has actually been able to answer that question. And yet, actors will all say, I'm a people watcher. I watch people all the time. I observe people. I learn so much from watching people. And I think if there's even one thing that you've been watching people do your entire life and you don't know what it is, then there could be thousands of things that people are doing that you don't know what they are. If we as actors, if our job is to transform and we don't know what we do and we don't know exactly what other people do, then how can we say that we are transforming? And actors will often say, oh, my character wouldn't do that or my character would do that. And I say, well, how do you know? How do you know? You don't know unless you've observed yourself to the T every single second. So observation is a, is a very important uh, start to what I teach actors. Um, back in, I look exactly the same, don't I? I look exactly the same. <laughs> Uh, back in second year at NIDA, I was cast as Antonio in The Merchant of Venice. Um, John Clark, who was the director of the school at the time and directed the play, his uh, take on the play, which is not uncommon, is that it's a very anti-Semitic play. And he didn't want us to shy away from the fact that our characters weren't necessarily the nicest people, especially Antonio. I love the fact that I was playing Antonio because he was the titular character. He was the Merchant of Venice. But Shylock was the character we all wanted to play because he was a much more badass character, right? But I was playing this character and it started to get interesting when John tried to get me to do something in a scene that was completely impossible for me. Completely impossible for me, a young 20 year old uh, country boy from a town of six and a half thousand people, second youngest uh, guy in the year, probably third youngest person in the year. Nice, friendly guy. And he wanted me to come into a scene and talk to Shylock, the scene where I ask him for a loan and to not look him in the eye for the entire scene. So it's just an exercise, just don't look him in the eye for the entire scene. So imagine for a second you're walking into a person's home to ask them for a substantial loan and you don't look at them in the eye for the entire time. Which is something you imagine an anti-Semite might do, a horrible person might do to somebody that they don't like, even when they're asking them for a favour. This was absolutely impossible for me to do. Emotionally, um, physically, I couldn't bring myself to not do it and I fought John for six weeks until finally I just surrendered. He just wore me down and I finally did it. On the open dress rehearsal, the night before opening night, the entire uh, crowd was filled with all the people from the school that had seen my work for the last year and a half. And they'd known what I do, what I am like. I'm a nice guy. Um, and they all came up to me one by one after the show. And I can't tell you the word they used to describe my character, but everybody came up to me and said, Oh my God, I can't believe your character. I hated him so much. He was such a, insert the word that I can't use here. Now, for me, I would have thought the only way I could play such a detestable character would be to act badly, to act like a horrible person. I didn't have to. All I had to do was do the opposite of what I'd been raised as a young Catholic altar boy in a country town to do, which is be polite, be nice, look at people when you're talking to them. Don't tell them that they have failed when they haven't failed. That's a horrible thing to do. But in that act of effectively being completely counterintuitive to what my gut was telling me to do, if you'd have asked me my intuition, my gut, my impulses, everything would have told me that I have to look him in the eyes. And that's what I said for six weeks. When I did the exact opposite, transformation happened. And it was as simple as going this direction and being turned that direction and going that direction. It was a complete transformation. 
took six weeks because I fought every step of the turn, but when I finally faced this way, I went for it. Point being initially, transformation is actually uh, important, uh, and second, that it's actually very, very simple if you do it immediately. If you take forever to do it, that you've got so many reasons why you don't want to continue doing it. Um, very often, and acting teachers and directors and so on will talk about we have this comfort zone, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. But I've always taught actors that the comfort zone that we normally talk about is far from comfortable, so let's stop talking about it as a comfort zone. Uh, it's a familiarity zone. The comfort zone is a place where you are comfortable. The comfort zone is where you've just had a wonderful uh, lovemaking session and you're eating pizza and you're watching Netflix and chilling, whatever it is that is totally comfortable for you. You've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, you've got nothing to worry about, that's comfort. When you're standing in a situation like this, I'm pretty good at this, but I'm by no means comfortable. My mouth is going dry right now. I'm realizing that I'm wandering. I'm worrying if, am I keeping up to the time on the script? Um, so I can be as comfortable as one can be, but I'm not comfortable. This is a familiar place, but not the most comfortable place for me to be. Outside that is what I call the stretch zone, and outside that is a panic zone. The panic zone is when you stretch a muscle and it snaps <coughs> No longer can you use that muscle, but also in the future, when you go to use it again, you're going to be reticent to push it too far because you hurt yourself so severely last time around. So this is what I teach actors, um, that they must, they can't learn, and they don't want to learn in their comfort zone. They can't learn in the panic zone. They can really only learn, and the familiarity zone, you don't really think about it, and in the stretch zone is the only place that you can really be learning. So that's where I try and keep them most of the time. When I do that, the question arises, but I was going with my gut. You told me to do something completely different. Now it's your impulse, it's not mine. And we get the words impulse, intuition, inspiration, all of these different I words, uh, impulse, instinct, intuition, and inspiration. And people in real life, actors, use these words completely interchangeably. Once again, one of the big things that I do with actors and I do with people in the corporate world as well is getting people to use the correct or use common definitions of words so that we understand what we're talking about. If we look at intuition as being, for instance, the definition of intuition being an immediate apprehension or cognition without reasoning or inferring, if that is the definition of intu intuition, then saying my intuition is always right is kind of like redundant, like what's the point of saying that because the definition of it is, is that it's always right. If we use the word impulse and we say you should always go with your impulses, well an impulse is a chemical or an electrical kind of signal being sent off, an exchange of something of some sort, uh, a, a leaf blowing in the breeze is following impulses, me evacuating my bowels is following impulses, me sneezing or laughing is impulses, I can't not follow my impulses, so there's no point really talking about impulses. Inspiration, I breathe out, I expire, I breathe in, I inspire. Every breath is literally an inspiration, so there's really no point talking about inspiration. So when it comes down to it, we're left really with intuition, and what the hell is intuition? <laughs> it's not an exact science. So I try not to talk about stuff that is subjective with actors. I try and talk about objective things as much as we possibly can. What you see up here, if you were scrolling through your Facebook feed right now, this would stop you in your tracks. In between all of the cat videos and the funny, you know, the, the, the laughing goats and the babies of your friends and all of that, this is going to stop you in your tracks because it's pattern interrupt. It stops the brain and it goes, hmm, what's going on? Not only that, it, as a spiral, it directs your eye right into the center. And the third thing is it actually looks like an eye. So we're born with inbuilt facial um, recognition software as children, and as we get older and older, obviously it becomes more and more important that we go straight to the eyes to understand what's going on. The eyes are the windows to the soul and all of that. So this already um, breaks the pattern. As an actor, as a director, as a writer, as a teacher, I've spent my entire career finding patterns and smashing them finding where there are no patterns and creating them. It took me about the first 10 years to work out that that's what I was doing, not just being destructive, but that's what nature does. We break things down, we rebuild things. We break them down, we rebuild them. We eat things, we eject it. It's all about coming and going and opening and closing and smashing and building. So when I think about transforming into different areas of our life, I think about pattern interrupt, like that. I think about pattern interrupt. And I just want to take a volunteer, thank you very much, from the audience. I want to show you a little something about pattern interrupt. So come and stand here. What's your name? Dasha. Dasha? Dasha, yeah. 
Correct. Um, so, <laughs> Dasha, just stand here for me for a second, please. Just there. Okay. Now, I want you to face me. Actually, go stand a little further back. See how malleable people are? This is wonderful. I have authority. I can do what I want. So, just stand there for a sec. So, I want, when I walk towards you, when I get to where you think is too close for comfort, I want you just to walk away. Just move away, okay? Okay. okay. <laughs> that was, I got closer than I thought I was going to, I'll tell you right now. So now I want you to do the same, and when you get as too close for me, I'll also move away. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much. You can have a seat. If you imagine that two people are walls, right, and between the walls there's a body of water, when they push the wa walls together, what happens to the water? First year physics, <laughs> the, the, water, the water rises, okay? And when you pull them apart, the water drops. And you're thinking, but what if it goes out the sides? It doesn't go out the sides, it just goes up or it goes down. If you imagine that that water between two people is tension, drama, interest, it can be negative or it can be positive. It can be sexual tension, it can be unwanted sexual uh, advancement, it can be whatever, you, whatever it is that's dramatic to the scene. Um, Alfred Hitchcock said, drama is life with the dull bits cut out. What we do as actors generally when we don't use counterintuition is our gut tells us, like Dasha's gut, told her that when I got too close she'll move away. But that's not dramatically interesting. It is momentarily, but not long term. When Dasha walks toward me and I don't move, it, that interest lasts longer. My whole thesis for the last 20 years has, has basically been that interest is not subjective. Meaning may be, what we apply as the meaning may be, but interest itself is not subjective. This, unless you're scrolling through the Facebook feed of the private group of the Spiral Stained Glass Window Society, this is going to arrest your attention. Whether you like it or not is, is immaterial. This is going to grab your attention. So, what's the point of all of this? First of all, if we don't know what we do in society, we can't change that. I do believe that transformation is an important part of life, otherwise we just continue to do what we've always done. If we realize that pattern interrupt is one of the... S I'm only joking. I did that as pattern interrupt. I was just, I was just joking. <laughs> because you're used to the sound of my voice and the dulcet tones, and when I make that pause, when something stops, when something breaks that pattern, anyone who's half asleep in the audience suddenly goes, shit, is he looking at me? <laughs> oh, it's pattern interrupt. Okay. Now, if I did pattern interrupt every 30 seconds, you would never look up again when I did it. I'd have to take my pants off and go, oh my God, look at that. <laughs> and you'd say, I didn't bring my telescope, and that would be the end of that. <laughs> but if we understand that through pattern interrupt alone, what I was doing un unknowingly and unwittingly at first with Antonio was, John was forcing me to break the pattern of what we expect in society and what we expect as a nice, pleasant, nice, polite person is that we come into the room, we look the person in the eye that we're talking to and we be polite to them. All we have to do is break that pattern and all of a sudden we transform. Now that, this technology can be used by you guys for two ways, for evil and for good. <laughs> for evil and for evil. <laughs> Obviously, you can identify quite easily that person standing way too close to me, but can everybody understand when you're standing too close to someone else? That's an important thing to realize. If you find that you um, are having trouble relating to people and you feel like you're doing everything you've been told to do, as I say, what I've done over my entire career is if there is a pattern, I break it. If there's no pattern, I create one. So if you keep, if you hear people say, I keep doing this thing all the time and everyone tells me to do this and it's not working, then clearly you need to break that pattern. If what you're doing is you are constantly yo-yoing between one thing and another, then that itself is its own pattern. So that's not necessarily the greatest thing to do either. When it comes to um, transforming though, when it comes to taking risks, when it comes to using counterintuition, I'm not advocating, of course, that you um, do anything dangerous. I'm not advocating that you do anything that's abusive. I'm just saying that rather than, I guess, the salmon swimming upstream, if you swim across the stream, you're already going to be doing a lot better than most of the other people in society who are just mindlessly flowing downstream. 
Um, you'll still be using the force and the momentum of the river that's washing you down the stream, but by swimming across it, you're going to get uh, more interesting and different results simply by using a little bit of counterintuition. You don't need to swim upstream and exhaust yourself and die like most of the salmon do. Uh, that's not the, the lesson here. But if you do make uh, counterintuitive choices and you actually do start to transform, the most important thing like parkour here or free running is that you need to land well. You need to learn how to land, absorb the impact, roll, and keep on moving. And you could learn all sorts of things about walking on the ledges of buildings and swinging off bars and doing all sorts of things. But if you break your leg every time you land, you only do it once. <laughs> so if you want to take a risk as actors, and going with your gut is complete anathema to, um, uh, to uh, going with your gut is anathema to taking a risk, um, you must learn how to land because you are going to land awkwardly many times. As a friend of mine said years ago, if you could survive a fall at terminal velocity, you could survive a fall from Mars. And I was like, yeah, dude, you could. In the last couple of years, we've had a guy jump from outer space to the Earth with a parachute, and we've had a guy jump out of an aeroplane without a parachute and land safely in a stunt airbag. So the next person who decides to jump from outer space without a parachute is going to be the definition of fearlessness because at that point, if you can literally survive that, you can pretty much survive absolutely anything. So parkour, landing well. Anais Nin said, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. If you don't transform, the downside, as far as I'm concerned, is the world remains the same. And if you're happy with the world, fantastic. But if you're not, ha not happy with the world, then oh, so you're not happy with yourself, then that's the way the world will remain. If you're happy with yourself, fantastic. But as actors, we get to dive into characters, use counterintuition, transform into those characters, and then we learn from those, have a catharsis, help you guys have a catharsis, and then we move on to the next one. We never fear going into a dark or a dangerous or a tricky character because we know there'll always be another one. If you guys go into a period of transformation in your life and you don't know that you can do another one after that, you probably won't go into the first one. So, as Anais Nin says, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. If you know that you are constantly changing, the world is exciting because it's also constantly changing. And 20 minutes to go, fantastic. Um, I just want to leave you with one final thing. Um, and it's a lot of quotes today, but the Nietzsche quote about... Um, when you are fighting monsters, be careful that you don't become a monster yourself. When you go into these dark places, and they can be quite dark, and sometimes they're just swimming across the current, but things will come up, things will be dredged up, things will be challenging, and other people, when they see your growth and your transformation, will be more threatened than you are, especially if they feel like you're becoming powerful when they've thrived on your powerlessness. The second half of the Nietzsche quote is, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss also stares back into you. We're actors, as Tom Stoppard said, we're actors, we're the opposite of people. We've been staring into you guys for a long time and that makes you the abyss, right? And like Shylock, that's a pretty badass character to play. So keep doing that, transform, and hopefully you'll transform other lives along the way. Thank you very much.